chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh, and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with Nick. Hello, everyone. It's a genuine pleasure for me to have Mark Hirschberg with us tonight. Mark is an author, university instructor, startup executive, and the author of Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You, and a fantastic app called the Brain Bump app. So stay tuned to the end of this episode so that you can get some more details on that. We're going to talk a little bit about your book today, so the Career Toolkit, and it sort of covers things like professional skills such as networking, negotiation, leadership, and, and elements, elements like that. But a key thing I want to talk about is why is a career plan important? But we'll go into that in a, in a moment. But Mark, your CV is so long and distinguished that I had to try and distill it into a few sentences there. Give me a little background in terms of, number one, where on earth are you in the world right now? How did you start out getting all these degrees and what sort of motivated you to write this book? Sure. I'm based in New York City. And my career path has been this interesting dual path. When I came out of MIT back in the 90s, I started out as a software developer. This was during the dot-com era. It was a good time and I was in a good place to do it. So I began my career and early on, I realized I wanted to get into leadership positions. And to do that, I recognized it wasn't just about being a good engineer. Yes, I needed to be good at that. But there were these other skills that you've mentioned, leadership, team building, hiring, negotiating. No one ever taught me these skills. So I had to set out and teach them to myself. We didn't have great shows like this back then. We were a little more on our own. And I began doing that. But as I did so, I recognized these skills are not just for leaders, not just for executives and managers. They are for everyone. So I began to upskill my team. I wanted to teach these skills to everyone in the company. And as I was doing this, a funny thing happened. Now, I went on and continued to grow my career. I became a CTO, Chief Technology Officer, CPO, Chief Product Officer. I built multiple tech startups, as you've noted, some classic startups, some helping Fortune 500 play startup, and I've gone on from there. But the funny thing that happened is MIT had gotten feedback from companies saying, we're looking for these skills in the people we hire, not just your students, not just engineers, not just college grads everyone, but we can't find these skills either. No one's teaching it to them. So MIT recognized we need to start to incorporate these skills into our curriculum. When I heard that, I reached out. I said, here, I've got some content. Please take it. Hopefully this is helpful. And I thought it would be a one and done. But instead, they said, wait, not so fast. Please help us create some additional content. And in the process of doing that, they said, we have these great professors but you're bringing a different perspective as a practitioner. Can you help teach the class? And so for the past over 20 years, the class has been co-taught by a number of professors and a number of people like myself who are practitioners. And so I've had this parallel career doing that, turned that into the book. I was not planning to write a book. I thought I'd write up some notes for the class, but then it kept growing and growing and we generalized it. It's not just for engineering students or even students. And so we generalized it to anyone in office work and put out the Career Toolkit book. And now I speak all over the world. And then, of course, the app that we'll talk about a little later. So you ruined one of my questions, which is going to be, you've studied physics and engineering. How did you learn soft skills and people skills? Because it's, it's something I do in my class as well. We, I have my one-on-ones with my, with my students. And I say, OK, let's forget all the technical tools and skills that you're going to learn. What soft skills do you think you need to learn? And immediately things like negotiation, teamwork, public speaking come up because these are, these are skills that you need to, to build your career basically. And they don't teach it at school. Perhaps you do a play or you, you discuss one of your projects in class, perhaps for five minutes if you're lucky. But we've, if you look at what we're doing, we're doing this as a career, talking in front of people. How did you as an engineer get over that hump of being a people person, or was that something that came naturally to you? It definitely wasn't natural. And don't worry if it's not natural for you. I'm going to pull an example. You mentioned earlier the ballroom dancing. I got into competitive ballroom dancing, and I actually became one of the top dancers in the U.S. 
But when I began, I was horribly bad. I had no rhythm whatsoever. I was embarrassingly bad. And yet I went on to become one of the top. And it's not because I had this great natural talent. It's the fact that I didn't have the natural talent. I said, I need to work at this. I need to put in the effort. And the people who were at stage one better than me because they were just naturally better, they didn't have to work as hard. They didn't put in as many hours training. And they were better at first, but they just kind of plateaued or moved slowly because I put in all that time and effort. I surpassed them. And the same is true for these interpersonal skills I developed, and this can be true for you too, there are people who are just naturally good at, and so they don't put in the effort. And they might be better than you today, but when you put the effort in, you're going to get better. It's just like in sports. There are people who are naturally good at, but those of us who train get better. And in fact, I think it gave me a slight advantage because many of the people who are naturally good at, they can't tell you why. Say, I, I just kind of know what to do. I just do this. It's kind of obvious. It wasn't obvious to me. So I had to really break it down and understand it. I think that gives me a better grounding when employing these skills and certainly was helpful for teaching others because I can understand the components I had to explain. You speak about doing this course with alongside the professors and yourself who comes from, from industry. So you don't have an education degree as in pedagogic training. Do you think that the degrees today are really getting people ready, ready for the workplace? Do you, would you suggest, I mean, obviously you've got children, you want them to go to MIT as well, but would you suggest they go and do a regular degree or would you think, would you suggest that they do something more practical, more hands-on? I do need to credit my mom because she was a teacher, retired, and has a master's degree in early childhood education. So I learned a lot from her, both implicitly from how she raised my brother and I, but even as we were older, she taught us certain education techniques. And I didn't think much of it at the time, but it's actually been extremely helpful, not just in the formal teaching that I do at MIT and on programs like this, but even when I engage with coworkers, I have to explain to colleagues, here's why we need to do this. I can employ some of those techniques. But now to the question you asked, I think there is an inherent problem in our education system. That's not to say we shouldn't do it, but there's a problem. If you look at higher education, this is an institution that goes back about a thousand years. And it really began around libraries, around these accumulations of knowledge. And what happens is we show up and we say, hi, I'm interested in majoring in this field. So the experts in the field, the professors with PhDs say, well, if you want to do that, take these intro classes and then some intermediate classes and a few of the advanced ones. And if you do all of that, the ones that we, the experts, tell you you need to take, plus some general requirements that the university throws on you but we don't care about, if you do all this, you get a piece of paper saying that you've achieved a certain level of knowledge. That's really what it's saying. It's not saying you are good at this job or skill. It's certainly not saying you're a good worker. It just says you have achieved this level of knowledge in economics, mathematics, marketing, whatever your field is. And that was fine 70 years ago. When I think about, at least in the US, the kind of big bureaucratic companies that dominated mid-century, where you sat in your cubicle and you had the inbox and the outbox and your boss said, here, do this. <clears throat> and you would say, yes, sir, thank you. And you do the work, stick in the outbox and say, what next, sir? And you were the cop. So you just need to know how to do marketing or economics for your field. But in today's world, our companies are these flatter organizations. We've cut out a lot of middle management. We're working with different people with different knowledge and backgrounds. We're working on goals that aren't quite clear when we're in new areas. In fact, oftentimes we know more than our boss. Back in 1950s, the head of marketing knew more than the 24-year-old. But today, the head of marketing in his 50s, he turns to a 24-year-old and says, explain the latest social media to me because I don't get it and you do. What, what should we be doing? And so that changes the dynamic and it's a different set of skills, many of these softer skills that you're talking about that are key to success. So to your question, we do need that foundational knowledge, but it is not sufficient. 
and we need to change the university system to address that. Absolutely. Well, I, I work at a vocational school, so we have we do hands-on work. So, for example, I get students who come from universities with marketing degrees, masters in marketing, but don't know how to do a Facebook post, don't know how to do anything that has been taught in their in their degree, which is a bit pointless. And especially since all of this technology is changing so quickly, you need to be able to, as you said, be comfortable with uncertainty, being able to navigate all of these new technologies and that that come on. And I think that's where the university education is useful in giving you the, the fundamentals or the principles of how marketing or these, these activities work. But the hands-on side is, I think, where a lot of people, is where a lot of people fail. Mark, I want to talk now about career planning. So the career toolkit, maybe give us a quick rundown of the book, and then let's go into the importance of career planning, because I think a lot of people think you get your first job and then, then you're set, and then you know life navigates itself for you. That's definitely not how it works, but I'd like to get your, your feeling on that. The book itself, 10 chapters, 10 skills. Now, 10 is a somewhat arbitrary number. If you look at different lists, you might see five skills, you might see 50 skills. It's really just where you're drawing the lines. But I chose to divide it into 10 groups, and the chapters are as follows. So 10 chapters, each one has a unique skill. And by the way, you don't have to read it in order. You can jump to whatever chapter and skill you need. Section one, careers. Chapter one, career planning. Chapter two, working effectively. Things like managing your manager, understanding the corporate culture that you're in. Chapter three is interviewing, although we look at as much, in fact, maybe even a little more from the hiring manager side, not just the candidate side, because we often talk about the candidate side, but many of us have to hire our teammates or our subordinates, and we have no training for that. Second section, leadership and management, chapter on the fundamentals of leadership, and I separate out management, I further separate that into people management and process management. And then the third section, interpersonal dynamics communications, networking, negotiation, and ethics. 10 chapters, 10 skills. Now, to your question of career planning, you're right. So many of us, myself included, I got my job. I thought, well, I'll just see where it goes. And there are a handful of companies, tiny, tiny, tiny handful of companies that say, we're hoping you will be here for a few decades and we will help you manage your career. We see this with some of the larger consulting companies. You see it with some of the larger tech companies, financial services. But most companies, even companies of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 people, they don't give you a lot of career guidance. And in fact, most of us, the analogy I use in the book, it's like we're floating on the ocean. You're sitting there in the middle of the ocean in a boat saying, well, let's see where the currents take me. And it may take you where you want to go, but probably not. You should not just depend on the ocean currents. Of course, storms can come in. And that storm could be COVID. That storm could be a recession, a war. Something happens to your industry or your company, and that can blow you off course. Now, if we're on the ocean in this boat, what do we need to do? We need to start steering, rowing, sailing, whatever mechanism you're using for locomotion. But you want to proactively do it. And sometimes the currents will help. You will get a tailwind. Sometimes you have a headwind, but that means in either case, you can't simply abdicate and say, let me see where I wind up. You have to own your journey. You have to own your career. And that means having a career plan and actively managing to it. And while that doesn't guarantee success, the lack of a plan pretty much invites failure. That plan around now and the, some of the degrees and some of the jobs that we're working on now in five to 10 years might also evaporate. So how do you navigate that in terms of a career? So obviously there were photo booth operators where you took in your, your spool of film and had your, your film process. Those jobs are gone and those guys are really good at their jobs. How, and, and you obviously deal quite a lot with executives, but imagine you're dealing with sort of middle management folks. How do they build a career, somebody who's not necessarily wanting to be a CEO or be a, C, a CTO, for example. So the, the, the masses of us, how do you manage a career for regular folks? I'm going to challenge your assumption that's more difficult. And implied in that is you're saying, well, there are going to be 
job titles in 10 years that don't exist today and some that exist today that aren't there. And yeah, job titles will change and they have changed in the past. You're right that the job titles themselves will change more rapidly in the future. But we don't pick a career for a job title. That's a common mistake is to say, I want this title, then that title, then the title after that. Let's take my job, CTO. I know CTOs who are managing teams of eight people. And these CTOs are spending half their days writing code. They have a couple more meetings than the rest of their team. And that's what they do. And they happily sit inside the office. And I don't want to talk to customers. That's why I became a CTO. I like the computer. I know CTOs who are running teams of a thousand people. Some of them still know how to code. They don't spend time doing it. They're very technical. I know others who you put them in front of a keyboard, they're a little lost. They have the CTO title, but they're not very technical, but they're very good at the vision, at selling. They go out on sales calls. They go out at conferences and they're external facing. They're more strategic. These are all CTOs. They all have the exact same title, but very different jobs. And so what we need to do is not think about the title. The title is just, the words we use on the box to encapsulate the set of tasks. But when we think about our careers, we think about at this stage, I want to do these tasks. I want to manage people or not. I want to be internal facing, external facing. I want to spend so much time in meetings, maybe a lot, maybe a little. How about traveling? Maybe a lot, maybe a little. You want to think about the tasks and activities that you want to do and then put a label on it. But again, I gave the example of these CTOs, one who manages a team of eight and one of a thousand. Well, there are also people who manage teams of eight at companies who don't have a CTO title, but they're doing effectively the same job. And you're not focused so much on the title as you are about other things like the job and is it what you enjoy, the challenge, the growth, the compensation. So that's what we, what we want to do is think about at the different points in our career, what do we want to be doing? And then put a label on it because that's easier to talk about. And you're right, those tasks themselves will change a bit. If you were in marketing 20 years ago, managing social media campaigns wasn't on that list. Okay, that's a new thing that came in. But the very concept even of overseeing campaigns and just shifted from print and radio and TV to social media, that's a, a smaller change. So I think we can still manage our careers it's the key is we don't focus on titles, but focus on activities. I think that's a, a very good way to differentiate the way we think about careers, because as you mentioned, COVID has come along and disrupted a whole bunch of things. People who were very people focused in offices completely lost that advantage. And who knows what other things are going to come out of the woodwork and change our career trajectories. When looking at a career, how important is it to have a vision of what type of organization you want to work at? A lot of folks will take the first job that they get. Is that wise or should one wait until you get a Coca-Cola or a company that aligns with your values? How important is it to, if we, if we can maybe use that as an example, to join organizations that align with your values? Certainly you want to be at a company you're more likely to believe in. There are exceptions and sometimes you need the paycheck, but it's helpful to believe in the product and the company and the culture. But one thing to watch out for when we talk about, you give Coke as an example, but really any big conglomerate. Now you go to the website and they have values and mission, but the reality is you're off in this little corner. When you look at that giant tree, you're way down at the bottom corner there on some little leaf. And you might have a company with amazing values, but if you just have a really bad manager, you're going to have a terrible experience. A common mistake is thinking culture are those values listed on the website. And when I say common mistake, companies make this mistake all, all the time. Culture is the daily expectations within the group of people with whom you work. And those expectations might be we prefer emails versus face-to-face -face meetings. It might be screaming at coworkers is okay. Or no, you can disagree, but you don't raise your voice. That's corporate culture, and that's never going up on the website. So I would worry less about the big corporate official values and more about the manager and the teammates and what your daily life would be like. Now, that can be a little hard to assess. And I have on the website we'll give at the end, 
I have a bunch of free resources, including how you can assess that culture while you're a candidate for the company. That, that's very exciting. The book, The Career Toolkit, if a owner of a business had to read this, would it be valuable for them as well? Or is this only for people looking to improve their careers? Could this be a HR handbook, for example, for an organization that wants to help build their staff? The answer is yes to both. Now, to the owner herself or himself, we spoke earlier about your career isn't titles. I know a lot of founders say, well, I'm a founder, I'm the CEO. My career is done because I just keep this title. And yes, your title might not change, although even many of them go on and say, I want to get a board position somewhere else later. But even if your title never changes, if you say, this is a job I'm going to have for the next 30 years, your job itself will evolve. And your career isn't just moving from title to title, but growing your skills. So if you, as a CEO or founder, want to get better at networking, at team building, at leading, well, the book has tools to help you. Now, to the other part of the question, you said, can this work as a handbook? It very much can. In fact, on the free resources page, I have a download for how you can use my book, or in fact, lots of other tools to create an internal training program. Now, this is actually very important. So often our training is, oh, here's a, a rising star in the company. Let's send her to some three-day leadership seminar. Great. Welcome back. Congratulations. You're a leader. Done. You had three days. Imagine if you did that with your sports team. Imagine you had a football team and you said, well, I'm going to send you off to a three-day football clinic. Welcome back. Okay. No more practice for your season. You're ready to take the field and you can play the rest of the season. That would be insanity. And yet that's what we do. We need to treat this more like what athletes or musicians do, which is regular practice and feedback. So what I recommend for companies, create small peer learning groups. I recommend about six to eight people in size. You can scale it up and there are ways to do this. And by the way, if you're at a tiny company, you say we don't have enough people or it's three of us and one of us is the boss and that's a little awkward. Because you do want people from different departments, but you don't want people from significantly different seniority, because that, that can be a little hard for the junior people. You can find people in other companies. You can create a local meetup group. They don't have to be from your company. So you create these little groups of six or eight people, and then you give them some content. And yes, you can use my book, and I even break down different ways you can chop up my book to use it for different learning objectives. But if you don't want to use my book, use another book. Use an article. Use shows like this and just have everyone listen to one of these episodes because you have such great value here. And then after everyone hears the episode or reads some of those pages, you come together to discuss it. Because it's in that discussion that I hear about your perspective on leadership, which is different from mine, but that gives me a, a deeper understanding. I learn another facet of these complex tools and that's how we're really learning. And so by doing this repeatedly, you're training just like we train for sports and you get these four great benefits. First, you're upskilling your team. Second, you're creating engagement. We know employees these days, they don't just want a paycheck. They want companies to help develop them, to look out for them, to care about them. So that's going to help with your engagement and retention. Third, you're fostering internal networks. We often talk of external networks to find new jobs or customers, but internal networks within the organization are equally important. And finally, you're creating a common language. If the book you pick, let's say you didn't use mine, but instead used good to great, and everyone's read it, you can say hedgehog model. Where it says, oh, I know exactly what you mean. I know what a hedgehog model is. And so you get all these benefits, and it costs you nothing if they use a show like yours or articles online, or $20, $30, depending on the book that you use. And this is a great way to upskill your entire team and I break it all down for you in a resource on my website that we'll give you at the end of the show. Now, this all sounds like a lot of work and a lot of effort. And I, and I think that's true of anything. You were talking about your ballroom dancing. That took effort. You might not have been the best ballroom dancer to start with, but you put in the effort, you understood the basics, and then you moved up and up and up a level. Building your career takes investment in building your career. And I think that's where the career toolkit obviously is, is a useful guide for that. How many people have you come across that don't understand that you've got to put effort into building your career? 
I think people get it, but they don't get it. Now, it turns out you can actually do this with very little effort. And let me give you an example. We're going to do this with negotiations because the math is easy to show, but this is going to apply to everything. Imagine you are 25 years old and you go and learn a little bit about negotiations. Maybe you read my book. Maybe it's another book. You take an online course. You're investing a matter of hours, maybe a few hundred dollars for a course. And now you have a job offer. Let's just say it's for $60,000. Instead of accepting the job, you say, wait a second, I want to negotiate. And so you email back and forth or you have a phone call. That's going to take you five or 10 minutes to negotiate or a few emails. And you negotiate for $61,000. Just $1,000 more. That's, that's pretty small. We can imagine that's doable. Now, if you do nothing else, at age 25, you're negotiating at $1,000 more and you stay in this job for 40 years, you just got yourself $40,000. 10 minutes of work, $1,000 for 40 years, that's $40,000 additional income. But of course, you're not going to stay in this job for 40 years. You will have raises and promotions and other jobs. You're going to negotiate for more money and more of other things. If you get just a little bit better at negotiating, you're not the world's greatest, just a little better, Suddenly, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earnings. Now, again, I pick negotiation because we can do the math. But if you get a little better at leading or networking or communicating, it's not that someone says, oh, you're a slightly better leader. Here's a thousand dollars more. But they're going to say, we want to promote you. We want you involved in this key project. You're going to have more opportunities come to you because of these skills. So it turns out just very little effort is going to give you that compounding interest effect that's going to really accelerate your career. I think that makes it really real, that example that you've just given. I think by putting the compound interest uh, concept on that, it just makes it so clear. And I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned that because one of my students just came to me very excitedly and said she's just got an internship. And they offer, offered her a certain amount of power and she negotiated. No, I would like X much more. And they came down a little bit, but it was her first job, the first internship, first time doing marketing. And she was confident enough to go and ask for that little bit extra. And as you said, that is going to set her in great stead for the rest of her career. And it was practice with, you know, a couple of dollars extra per hour versus when she's going to negotiate for, for bigger numbers. I think that's, that's such a wonderful example, Mark. Mark, let's move over to the employer side. Interestingly, you mentioned the, uh, the, the hiring manager side, which is often neglected. I want to ask you about a current example I've got again with my class. I said writing a cover letter is very important because that's one way for folks to, to show that you've put in a bit of effort to researching the company, understanding what the role is, and not just copying and pasting. With AI, everyone's CVs are going to look beautiful. Everyone's cover letters might say the, the perfect thing. How are hiring managers going to deal with all of this imposter, not imposter syndrome, but imposters out there writing beautiful cover letters, beautiful CVs driven by AI? What are the tools and techniques that they're going to use now to filter out the true, the good candidates from those who are just trying their luck? I may not be the best person to ask because I don't put a lot of stock into cover letters. The only time I care about it is people in sales. And so sales means, of course, salespeople, business development people, and HR people on the recruiting side because you are selling job openings. Those are all sales roles, but for everyone else, I'm less concerned about your cover layer. And even for those people, I sometimes just don't have time to look at. Understand that for many of us, when we post a job opening, we will get dozens, scores, hundreds of resumes coming in. Now, many companies use an ATS applicant tracking system, and that already might just put you in or out based on some keywords. I don't like or trust the ATS. I don't think it gets the subtleties I look for, but I will flip through the resumes. Most resumes, this isn't just me, this is in general, are looked at for around five to 10 seconds each. 
So what I do is I just skim the resume and I can very quickly put into a yes, no, or maybe pile. And I will go through hundreds of resumes, just take an afternoon, go through them all, put them in the piles. We send rejections to the no's, the maybes I keep around in case the yeses don't work out. And I follow up with the yeses. Now, at this point, maybe I start to look at the cover layers of the yes people, if I'm trying to distinguish, or if someone's on the bubble and the maybe pile, it could perhaps move them up a little. But I don't think for the reasons you named already, I didn't have time to look at. And for the reasons you named, I think it will become less valuable. What you can focus on, in addition to just your raw underlying accomplishments, be good at your job, achieve things, and that will stand out. Because if you can say, I doubled profitability, I increased efficiency 62%, doesn't matter how much AI someone else has, they can't say that. So do a good job, but then also develop your networks. Because whenever someone comes in through a network, they go right to the top of the pile. They avoid all that. I don't need a cover layer. I've got an endorsement from someone I know. I think that that networking side is extremely important in 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 finding a, a job, obviously. And I try and get my students to get involved in communities and networks of the industries that they're interested in, especially students who are starting out in the world who don't, haven't gone to, for example, MIT and have uh, the opportunity to to meet with these large companies. I've said to them, by the end of the year, they've got to go to five events. They need to choose five events and they need to have their faces seen because you never know who you'll bump into at some stage or when, our, when your CVs are going out. And Norway is a much smaller country than the US. Obviously, we've got 5 million people. So the, the likelihood of bumping into somebody <laughs> twice is, is, is quite high. Can you Talk to me a little bit about your brain bump ad because we've gone through the career toolkit and I think those 10 chapters that you've mentioned, it almost sounds like an, a mini HR MBA or mini career MBA, which is great. So I'm, I'm looking forward to looking forward to read that. But where does the brain bump ad come in? One problem with every book and just about every way we learn is that where you read information, is it where you need information? There's that disconnect. If you buy my book or other books or listen to the show, you're going to read it sitting at home or listen to it in the gym. But where do you need these skills? Well, the networking tip you're going to need two months later as you go to that conference. And you're thinking, what, what was it he said? I wish I had that here and now. Or for things like management skills, I think while managing a team, but I don't know exactly when and where I'll need a particular technique. I just need to remember it all so it's at the ready. And I recognize this is a problem with books, with shows, with my class. My students leave the class. I go, yeah, this was great. And then the information disappears. I wanted to help people retain information. And here's where my experience in technology, but also lessons my mother taught me about learning processes came into play. I... Recognize there's two modes of learning. So one is building that foundation. So you just remember things. Now, students know the best way to remember is spaced repetition. Look at your notes again. Read the chapter again before the test. See it repeatedly. Use flashcards. But as adults, we don't do that. There's no test. I don't want to make flashcards. I'm not going to read this book again. I barely had time to read it at first. So Brain Bump uses passive spaced repetition. What we do is we take the key ideas and all the key ideas from my book are in there, but also key ideas from other books, blogs, podcasts, talks go into the app. They're all tagged by topic. So if you say, I want to be a better manager, you're going to get the management tips. And then what you're going to get is each morning, let's say at 9 a.m., you set up so you get a little push notification. It's like a daily affirmation but with useful information. You see and say, oh, that's great. Swipe, done. But by seeing it over and over, all these different tips, you're going to retain it. And the key, of course, is that you choose when you want to see it. Because if I push out a tip to you at three in the afternoon, you're saying, I'm, I'm busy. I don't have time for it. Just interrupt my flow of thought. Say 9 a.m. is when I want to see it. When we expand to, right now we have business topics. When we expand to others, let's say marriage topics, you might say, I want marriage advice at 6 p.m. because that's when I go home and see my spouse. 
So it's getting the information to you when and where you want to see it. Now, there's also an on-demand feature. We gave that networking example. As you walk into the conference, you're thinking, ah, those networking tips, I can't remember all of them. Open up the app. Everything, again, it's tagged by topic. So you select networking. And you just flip through a few tips right before you go into that event. Or you flip through interview tips right before you go to the interview. So you get what you need, when and where you need it. And the Brain Bump app is 100% free, completely free on the Android and iPhone stores. When you download it, you'll get all these tips. The tips are all free. And in the 2.0 version coming out in the fall of 2023, you can add your own tips. If we don't yet have the tips, but you hear some great advice you want to remember, you'll be able to start adding it to the app itself, not just the ones we provide. Well, I've got a brain like a goldfish and everything that you've spoken about here is ticking a little, a little box for me. So if I could have those little flashcards coming off every now and then to sort of reignite that, that memory, that would be particularly helpful. So I'm going to share the link both in the podcast and so I'll, I'll put up a little link and then put it in the podcast notes. And then for your book, where can we get your book? So two sites to look at that you're going to put in the, in the notes. The book, The Career Toolkit, if you go to thecareertoolkitbook.com, you can see where to buy it. Amazon, of course, but local bookstores carry it as well and other online sources, ebook and print. There's articles I put out every week. There's a number of free resources I mentioned. So if you go to thecareertoolkitbook.com and go to the resources page, you can see free resources. Some of the first downloads, the first one is how to create this internal peer learning program we mentioned. One a little further down is how to understand a company's culture. Here are questions you can ask during the interview process and how to ask them respectfully. These are all completely free downloads. I don't even need to collect your email. You can just take it and use it. That's all at thecareertoolkitbook.com. And the app, in addition to the stores, if you go to brainbumpapp.com, you can learn more about the app and get the links for download. Well, Mark... I know that with just the one chapter that you've discussed in terms of negotiation and getting that slight bump in salary is going to have a lifelong effect on your career. I'm sure the other chapters have got all sorts of other nuggets of wisdom that we can apply in our real life. So I'm going to make sure my class, we get a, one or two copies for the class and make sure they read it and also get the folks to download the Brain Bump app. Thank you so much. I, I think this, this talk hopefully will inspire people to put a little bit more effort into uh, thinking about their career as you need to work at it. You need to build up the skills and techniques now so that you can um, have these successes later. So I'm, I'm particularly excited about this, this particular chat. So thank you so much for, for joining us and hopefully we'll see you live one day somewhere. Thanks for having me on the show. Come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with